Before I start, I have to take a moment to recognize these Apaco Revolution demic days that we find ourselves in. We are in the midst of a pandemic continuing for two years. We have the surge with Omicron happening right now, and we're trying to continue living our lives in a world that's not safe, continue to be able to do our work and keep our friends and our families safe. I'm a working mom, I have two children, and for the last two years, I have been giving conference presentations from my living room with them bouncing around right there in the same room as I am presenting. I cannot tell you how many times they interrupted me as I was preparing for this talk. Mom, I want ice cream. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. Can we play with balloons? What are, I mean, all day, all, all the time. So I live here in the DC area. I was hoping to be able to finish my presentation on Monday, but Monday was a snow day here, as was Tuesday, as will be tomorrow. Uh, so I did not have as much time to be able to focus on that with my kids being home. So I am here with you. I see you. I feel you through all of that. I developed this presentation and I was expecting to be able to bring my laptop and present from my laptop directly. But because of the streaming, um, they did have to upload it to a specific platform. So there may be some things that look a little bit different on the slides, but you will all have access to the slides for yourselves later as well. Oh, and <laughs> the QR code is missing from that. But the bit.ly is there, so if you type in that URL, you should be able to pull up the slides on your own device. So I'll give you a second to do that if you'd like to follow along. I also want to give explicit permission for you to live tweet or take pictures. I work with signing communities, and there are lots of videos and images and I do have explicit permission from everyone who will show up on screen, so you have that permission. Thank you for having me here tonight. I am thrilled to be here. It is complicated to physically be here, but I'm thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled that all of you are joining online as well. I'd like to give a vis visible description of myself. I am a white woman with brown hair, wearing glasses, and a deaf vibe t-shirt and jeans. The slides are typically dark with light colored text. And when you download the slides, you will see the notes that have descriptions of the pictures in those notes as well. I typically pause and give people a moment to look at the slide so that I'm not visually competing with that information as I'm signing. I'm using American Sign Language, and you're hearing the voice of the interpreters who are working with me. One is a coworker in the linguistics department who I've worked with for many years, and the other is an interpreter who has worked with me for many years, and I trust both of them to express my message as I would express it myself in English. You see on the slide that the word deaf has an asterisk beside it. So I want to note that some people use capital D deaf and some people use the word deaf with a small d. And that has been divisive in our community, but is also about identity. I myself identify as a deaf person and I use the capitalized form deaf for myself, but I'm not claiming that for anyone else, just for myself. You'll also see that the title includes a mention of spaces. And what I mean by that are the spaces we create when we work together, when we discuss linguistics, when we teach, when we do our research, 
and also the publication spaces that exist when we share our work and the online networks. All of those are the spaces that we create, and that's what I mean by spaces in this title. There are three parts to my presentation this evening. I will introduce myself and provide my statement of positionality. I'll also talk about deaf scholars and give a retrospective of deaf scholars work related to sign language documentation, which is also my work. And so that will lead into some specifics about the work that I have done, which will be the last portion of the presentation. That's actually not the emoji I picked, but I'm going to go with it. Okay. <laughs> I do not see myself as a traditional academic. I was shocked to be invited to give this talk. And as I thought about it, I was like, what do they want me to talk about? What am I supposed to talk about? And it took me a little while to get to the point of recognizing that that's not why I was invited here. This is an image from a tweet that was pinned on my Twitter account for a long time. And it's with the hashtag actual living scientist, stating that I am an actual living scientist and that I do research on sign language communities and providing access to sign language and sign language information through documentation. That is the work I do. And what I do is then take that work and show it more broadly to wider communities. And I like that sign, show. If you want to watch me sign it. Because it has beautiful iconicity of taking that information and making it visible to the communities that need it. I am a deaf ASL community member. So I am doing research on those communities but I am also thinking about that from my own perspective as I'm doing that research. And that is what I'm gonna talk about today. It's not a typical academic presentation of a paper or a presentation of a specific research project, but this broader concept of how we think about the work we do and how our positionality shows up in that. And hopefully I can address some of that with you all here tonight. I'm also trying to address what I would have wanted to hear as I started my career. When I was thinking I didn't have any authority, who am I to contribute to this field? I'm talking to those of you who are thinking that as well. Our lives and our experiences as part of communities are critical. For the ASL using community, it's often a fight to get recognized because English is so dominant. And we want to make sure that we are recognizing that and bringing that to the visual forefront as often as possible. As for what positions my work, and what influences me as I think about my work. I am a white, sighted user of visual ASL from a middle-class family from the Midwest. I use visual ASL and English, predominantly written English, for my working languages. This is a picture on the screen of me as a young girl. When with my family, we went to Gallaudet University. My family is hearing. And when they found out that I was deaf, they started to learn sign language. And parts of that were going for the summer for these week long programs at Gallaudet University. <laughs> and learning sign language and being immersed in that. What I remember most, of course, is the chocolate milk in the cafeteria. But 
that really gives you an example that I am from a hearing family, but a family that immediately started to learn sign language and was willing to do this kind of programs for me. And that's not true of most deaf people who have hearing families. So I was very lucky. My family was middle class. They had the economic status to be able to move to places where I could get a better education. So all of that frames my work. I also did my graduate work at Gallaudet University. I am married to a hearing black man and we have two beautiful mixed children. Again, each and every aspect of this frames who I am and how I think about my work. And it's important to represent that as we do our work. So there's three different signs there that represent deaf in ASL. And the artwork by Christine Sun Kim, representing that there are many different ways of being deaf. It's not a heterogeneous experience. And across those varieties of ways of being, there are lots of different overlaps. And again, all of that influences my practices. So thinking about the spaces that we work in and the ways that we work, how our embodied identities, embodied experiences play into that and how we make space for that in our work. The work that I do is language documentation, which includes linguistic description, linguistic anthropology, ethnography, sociolinguistics, social interactions. In all of those, we're valuing the language that's being used. And for me in documentation, it's taking that and making it shareable. So I'm here tonight to talk about language documentation work specifically, but I also want to give a little bit of history of language documentation that's happened within sign language description. And as I do that retrospective, I wanna look in a way that recognizes deaf scholars specifically. And also thinks about the spaces we create and who is included and who is not included. I'm gonna go through some of this relatively quickly, but there will be slides that have a picture of a person and a quote from their work. The text of the quotes is a little bit small on the screen. <laughs> and I know that I don't wanna go through and read each and every one of these in depth. So I'm going to touch on the main points from the quotes. But again, you all have access to the slides and you can look at the full quotes later, even as I go through these relatively quickly. But the goal here is to celebrate and recognize the deaf scholars that have been doing this work and give them the well-deserved attention. Not just the hearing scholars who are our allies and work with us in the field, but really recognizing the deaf researchers who have been doing this work as well. Often the hearing researchers get disproportionate attention and are recognized for their work more easily than the deaf researchers. So I'm highlighting specifically deaf researchers in this presentation. Okay. 
Joseph Hill's quote talks about the importance of deaf linguists. And that often that work with hearing allies is what gets them the recognition. Carol Padden and Tom Humphreys talk about categories and how we often think of categories as fixed, but they are really not. They are based on our lives, our experiences, and our interactions. Barbara Canapel explains that deaf people do have languages, just like everyone else, and they are complicated and involve social considerations and much larger systems. Aaron Wilkinson, Jordan Fenlon, and others provided an overview, also recognizing that deaf people are multilingual. Aaron Moriarty Harrelson talks about representation positionality, and authority of deaf-related research. Lin Ho talks about deaf-led research, noticing that most work is often led by hearing researchers, but that when it is a deaf-led research, there can be a deeper bond Joseph Murray problematizes the concept of native, as a native signer, native speaker, and the fact that in sign language research, that has often been primarily white people studied as native sign language users, which excludes black ASL and other varieties of our languages. Hilda Howland emphasizes that there is no such thing as neutral. Resonet Mojus explains that identity can never be removed. And for sign language representation, the signer cannot be removed. When I talk about my work with the ASL sign bank, you'll see how I have to think about that a lot in terms of representation. Octavian Robinson and John Henner emphasize that we should involve deaf bodies, involve all deaf bodies, involve all bodies. Gabrielle Hodges recognizes that the field of linguistics was established on hearing norms and often what's actually happening in a wider range of communication is ignored to stay within the range of those norms. Marta de Muller, John Bosco Kanama, as well as other authors. Again, I'm pointing out these two specifically because I know they identify as deaf. I do not personally know the other two authors. Talk about the need for us to recognize communities rather than a single community. And that within those communities, we are not all the same. It's not one identity within any of those communities. Annalise Kusters recognizes that who we are affects the situation. The hearing status of the various people involved is important and reflects on the semiotic repertoires of how we are multimodal and how we use various resources. Nick Palfreyman 
reflects on his journey to becoming a researcher and how various roles in the community shaped that. I hope that you will take the time to look more closely at these slides and read the quotes in depth. Again, my goal here was to recognize these deaf scholars and keep their thoughts in mind as we think about the kind of research that I do and the work that I'm doing. How we are making sure that representation is there, positionality is there, how we're thinking about all of those things as we create these spaces and also about the categories not being fixed. I think about categorization a lot. It influences what we do for linguistics, for archiving, for the types of signers, for librarians, for all of this work. So remember, my husband is black and I am white. My son, when he was four years old, said, oh, Papa's brown, Mama's pink, I guess I am. <laughs> and he said, I am a little bit brown. So he was recognizing the categories, but recognizing them in his own way. I'm hoping, oh, we have the right video here, great. Excellent. I wasn't sure whether the video would play, so I'm so glad it's there. I wanna give a short description first. I'm gonna show a video, and this is my other son, and I'm sharing this video with his explicit permission. He was about three years old at the time, and from off camera, I was signing to him. I said that I am deaf, and he is CODA, C-O-D-A, the child of deaf adults. And then he does this sign back. I signed deaf in that way and tried to tell him that he's a coda. So that's what's happening as this video plays out. So at the very end, I said, you are a coda. I labeled him and categorized him. He rejected my category immediately and said, no, I am Oliver, which is his sign name. And so he claimed his own label for himself rather than the category I was trying to provide. So again, as we think about what deaf scholars have said and the work that I want to do, I'm reflecting on all of this as part of how I move forward. All the categories we use to delimit languages and identities and determine our shared spaces can be dangerous if we treat them as fixed and bounded. I try to focus more on the language experiences that people actually have, how they interact with each other, how all of that varies. how they themselves use the categories. And I see that beauty and messiness and the importance of the language practices there. And I'm not seeing that as someone separate from it, but reflecting on all of it.
So I want to shift direction a little bit. I did a retrospective of one specific journal, Sign Language Studies, which is a journal focused on research on sign languages since 1972. The first one is from a book on deaf scholars and talking about the research practices of deaf scholars and how they relate to the participants and the communities. So that's a question that's raised in that first one. So as I did my survey, I also looked at Gone, Gone et al's work. and how they discuss data collection and citation. The third is a quote from Adam Shembry's presentation in 2019 along those same lines, looking at sign language research and how we make our methodology transparent. And so from all of these, I set up my framework for looking back through the studies that have been published in Sign Language Studies. And my guiding question as I looked at them was what are the research practices of scholars who do language description and how do they relate to deaf communities? I wanted to know whether they identified their relationship to the deaf community, whether they talked about their own signing experience, and how they represented the data, as well as whether the data was accessible or archived somewhere, and how deaf people participated in their research process. So I looked at a total of 31 articles from 1973 to 2019. I did a search for keywords, field work, field methods, and language description. And that was able to get most of them, but some of the earlier articles, because the metadata wasn't available, I had a harder time searching. So I did a little bit of a manual search. And there's a link at the bottom here that goes to the paper pile for all of the articles that are included in this review. So those 31 articles represented countries from around the world. And there were some from the 70s, some from the 80s, some from the 90s, and on until today. I want to go through this quickly because it's not a main point, but I want us to think about this information. And again, the slides are shared so you can read more detail in the presentation notes. So for the question of whether the authors discuss the relationship with the sign language community, 87% did not. can't see the number there, but whatever's left from 87%. So it was four of the articles out of 31 that did. One example was Ted Supala saying that he was, sorry, Sam Supala saying that he was deaf from a deaf family and used American Sign Language. Sorry, the formatting is... Again, a little bit messy from the switch from Keynote into PowerPoint, but this is whether the authors explicitly discussed their signing experience and signing knowledge. 76% did not. 20% kind of did. Wait, let me make sure I'm saying this right. Yeah, right. 76% did not. 20% talked about it for the research team. And the 4%, which is actually one article, did discuss 
their own signing knowledge and the signing knowledge and experience of all the team members. For how the data was represented, and in this case I'm talking about signed language as the data, So this isn't really a total, this was just a count of all the articles. Various ones included various types. So the numbers don't add up to the total of the articles, but seven of them didn't have any representation of the sign language. Seven had glosses with some source. 13 times there were glosses only. 19 times, nine times, excuse me, there were translations, et cetera. This is an example of gloss with the source. So you see this is from Japanese sign language. The gloss is listed there at the bottom as the figure, as part of the figure title. Again, sorry for the formatting here. Is the primary data accessible or archived? Out of 31, one article had archived data that you could go and access. Several of them said they planned to. One had a link, but when I clicked on the link, it was broken. The rest did not. Explicit discussion of how deaf people were involved in the project. In six cases, there was no discussion of it at all. Most of them discussed it related to the research participants. A few mentioned, oh yes, the primary investigator is deaf, and those that had that also included descriptions of all of the other members of the research team. But predominantly, it was just a description of deaf people as participants, not in other roles. So overall, we don't have a lot of transparency to that, to accessing the data, to understanding that. And I'm not here to blame anyone for that. That has been the tradition of practice in our field and things are changing over time. And I notice myself getting better and better at this gradually as I continue to consider all of these things and think about how we can change this and make these kinds of things more transparent. It's not an overnight change, I just want to bring it to the forefront so that it's something we're thinking about. This is again from Adam Shembri's presentation that in sign language linguistics, we need to improve this kind of transparency, both for the research itself and so that sign language using communities can have access and understand the research that we're doing. Indigenous communities discuss this often. Wesley Leonard, 2018, discusses the same concept. So I wanna think about all of this, and then now I'm gonna get a little bit more specific about three tools that we can use to address these kinds of problems. <clears throat> so now this brings me to the last portion of my talk, which will be about the work that I do. So everything I've said thus far seems like a big fat preface, but I think that it really lays out a context for the work that I do, the things that I think about, and the type of impact I hope to have, as I'm certain many of you in the room do as well. So given what we know deaf scholars have said, and they are really making public what deaf communities have known for decades. I also think about my own experience as a deaf linguist and how I access information. For example, when I read linguistics texts, often you can infer that language is equated to speech. And these sorts of assumptions 
create the kind of space that we're working within. And that also affects what I do. <clears throat> I've worked with four languages, three in sort of single projects and one with multiple projects. I've been a linguist for 20 years now, OMG, <laughs> since 2002. Can't believe that that's true, but it is. This is me on the screen in Kenya 20 years ago. I almost said two, but definitely not two years ago. I learned Kenyan Sign Language when I was working with the Kenyan deaf community on the Kenyan Sign Language Dictionary. This was my very first taste of language documentation. Came back to the US, enrolled in, 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 in a linguistics program at Gallaudet. I also teach field methods at Gallaudet where I've had a chance to work with multiple sign languages through that class. I also have worked with Haitian deaf people to document their sign language. But for the most part, I work with American Sign Language and American Sign Language communities. The first tool I'd like to talk about has to do with ethical considerations. And the spaces that we're in, this is something that I give a lot of thought. Of course, it's nice to have guidelines when you're thinking about ethical considerations. So here are a couple. At the very top, um, this is a work produced by the World Federation of the Deaf entitled Working Together. In the lower right, well, sorry, lower right for me, bottom left for you, is Sign Language Communities Terms of Reference, SLC TR. And then on the right, the Sign Language Linguistics Society Ethics Statement for Sign Language Research. I'll be focusing on SLCTR. So again, this is, stands for Sign Language Communities Terms of Reference Principles. They drew a great deal from guidelines that exist for working with indigenous populations and created a number of principles for working with deaf or sign language communities. Again, I understand that this text is way too small to expect anyone in the room or online to read it. This statement though, reflects the spirit of all of the principles. So as a whole, deaf people are the users of the language and are the main stakeholders and have the right to decide how their language is represented. All of the guidelines sort of boil down to this point, and I reflect on this a great deal in all the work that I do. One example of how I take these guidelines into consideration is in my work on the Philadelphia Signs Project. This began in 2015 and is still ongoing. I work with Meredith Taminga and Jamie Fisher. They both work at the University of Pennsylvania. And this is a great example of work that originated in the signing community. So deaf Philadelphians recognized how different their way of signing is than most of the country. And they spearheaded an effort to start a documentation project. They reached out to Jamie, Jamie reached out to me, and I got involved in the project. So I was invited to work with the community, not the other way around. They were not an object of interest for a researcher. Another thing from the SLCTR principles, they say that the deaf community has a right to construct and claim authority about the knowledge of their community. One way to do that is to have deaf people involved in the process. So on the Philly Science Project, the main interviewer who you see on the right is deaf, is local to Philadelphia, and considers himself and is a part of the Philadelphia deaf community. This is also available online. So all of the work that we have done is available to the community immediately, and they can use these resources in the way that they see fit. So 
So that was the first tool, ethical considerations. The second has to do with representational practices. I think a lot about data, how we manage it, how we share it. And I have this up here to reinforce the point about rep textual representation. So this is an ability to type in something into a search engine, to manipulate language on a screen. It is not easy in any language, in any mode. It took thousands of years for written language to develop in such a way that it was adequate to represent spoken language. For signed languages, we're still working on it. Traditionally, we have relied a great deal on written text. Sign languages around the world do not generally have their own written systems, but there have been a few attempts. So you see on the bottom left, the white text at the bottom. This one is called ASL Write. Um, this did not become widespread. In the second image, you see an example of glossing, which is a bold or a all caps English word that's meant to represent the core meaning of the sign. In this case, it's woman. And glossing is the most widely used form of representation or transcription. There are also notation systems. The most well known is the Stokey notation system, which is in, meant to represent the phonological form of a sign. Again, in this case, it's woman. But this is not something that is easily read. It's also not very keyboard friendly. So for this reason, people also continue to, re to rely on glossing. So these still images are from videos of people signing and take a look at what the gloss of that would be. You can see right away that a great deal is omitted. Facial expression, the form of each sign is unknown. Variance or variation are unknown. Pacing, speed, also unknown. Yet, this is our primary representation in publications, in presentations, And this practice is what led Dan Slobin to describe this as the tyranny of glossing. Um, I also referenced this in my publication that's forthcoming this week. <clears throat> I'd like to give you a very brief example of why glossing is so problematic. So what you see here is just a very simple handshape and it's a point. In ASL, this is a very, it's a very flexible um, handshape to use. It can be used as a referent. It can point to something and its meaning is derived from what I am referring to. But if you were to gloss this, here are some options. A single handshape can be represented in a number of ways in English. So then what happens is that the English tendencies are foregrounded. It brings in things like grammar, person, gender, and it then influences our understanding of the form and the use of the sign itself, which is problematic. And that is just one very simple example of many. And we know that things that stay have power. When I was doing my dissertation, which was testing out four different notation systems and how they represent handshape in acquisition, I coded over 1,000 handshapes 
And when I saw this quote, it was when I was working on my dissertation, it really struck me hard and it made me think about how much power it has when a word has staying power. Hashtag glossosang is a uh, term that was coined by Carl Brunel, excuse me, Carl Borstel, um, who picked up on something that I said where it's, if you're going to include sign language data, present it in a visual format without relying solely on glossing. So at the moment, we are kind of stuck with glossing, but when I think about how to work with this system, one of the things that I've done, as Diane mentioned in her introduction, was create a database called the ASL Sign Bank. This is a cloud-based database that stores ASL variants, so textual representations, and they are tagged with an ID gloss label as well as individual, excuse me, additional information. It's available on a public website. We have over 300 registered users. We refer to it in social media so that it's accessible there. And I talk about this a lot, so I'm not going to talk about it a great deal tonight. There's plenty of information online on the website if you are interested, but I will say this. Through this work, I have given a great deal of thought to how we represent our data and the categories that we use because databases require categorization. You can also use Elon with the ASL sign bank, which is what we did. And what I think is so important about this is that it means that the primary data, the video, is now represented and all of the information in the tiers can support what you see in the video. Here's what it looks like. I'll play a short clip. You'll see how the ASL sign bank works within Elon. This brings me to my last point about the third tool, and this has to do with open access, which means information is immediately accessible online and considering how knowledge is shared. Now, fortunately, we have the Austin Principles uh, that recognizes, or excuse me, that refers to the fact that data citation recognizes the centrality of data to research. This foregrounds this and really lays out the fact that our data is our knowledge. Our knowledge is based on our data. I was so influenced by the Austin principles that I then thought about what we have at Gallaudet University, which is hours and hours of video footage since the early 1900s that are currently in an inaccessible format. The Gallaudet University Documentation of ASL Project, also referred to as GUDA, was created because we care about that work. And we also wanted to make this available by using open access sharing principles. So we wanted these videos, this film footage to be available for people. And GUDA is also a call to action for others to make this footage accessible. I forgot to put in an acknowledgement that my husband made this graphic, so thank you, Oz. Um, this was by no means my handiwork, this was his. So what we are doing is creating a central sort of online landing spot for data to be categorized, to be annotated according to the same principles. And I'm currently working on this 
I am also using Gouda principles for other projects that I'm working on. I'll mention those two briefly in the little bit of time I have remaining, and then we'll use the rest of our time for Q&A. So one project I'm working on at the moment is shortened to MOLO. It stands for Motivated Look at Indicating Verbs in ASL. From the very beginning, we built this project with Gouda principles in mind. So we thought about how we will take care of our data and share it according to open access principles from the very beginning. Now the project started during the pandemic. So in person, wasn't a possibility. Everything happened over Zoom, which was kind of fortunate because it meant everything was already digitized. So that saved us a step. We had 23 sessions that were two hour interviews consisting or <laughs> including two participants and two researchers. So we noticed though that the way that people sign is different, or in video, is different than in person. So I think a fun twist on embodied discourse here is emboxed discourse, because each of us existed in sort of a Brady Bunch world of boxes on Zoom. And I imagine it also influences how people who use spoken languages also communicate. And I hope that the annotated video data will be released later this year. Now here's another one, and again, the formatting cut off the top of the, um, <clears throat> the title, but O5S5 is a project that documents the experiences of the ASL communities in the time of COVID-19. The O5S5 is sort of a cross-linguistic pun. If you know the signs for document, and COVID, you will recognize that they use the same hand shapes as the letter O, 5, S, and 5. This project was started because we saw in the midst of the pandemic that archival products were, uh, excuse me, archival projects were still going on. So for example, the MI Diaries by Sneller and Evans Wagner were still going on. So given that as an inspiration, I asked my field methods class or my field, field methods students if they would like to do something similar for the ASL community and or ASL communities and see what their pandemic experiences have been. They took me up on it. We started this project together again with open access principles in mind, thinking about how to make this data available to the community. We also have a website that's currently available. We describe our processes, practices, and values, and we will upload the videos there as well. If you're interested, um, the access information is at the bottom of this slide in the notes. Um, when you download them, you can see how to access that website. Now I have a three minute video um, documenting, or excuse me, to show you what this document pre documentation project is, or what it looks like. There's no audio, just captioning. You left. She just left you left. Yeah. I never saw her. Maybe a bot saw her.
So in a nutshell, that's the work that I do. Hopefully I was able to show you that in such a way that honors deaf linguists and what deaf scholars and deaf communities value. And I hope that I showed you just how much humans are multimodal. We are multilingual and we resist categorization. We like fuzzy categories. We don't like to be defined in such rigid ways. And we get accustomed to these categories, but these are all things that I think about in my work. And one of the reasons I've reflected on why I do this work so much and what drives me, and I think that it's a direct response to the history of data not being shown. And so as a response, to the work that comes before me, I am very driven to show the data. And I include myself in that as a deaf linguist. And I also try to keep in mind the multitude of deaf users out there. Thank you. I know, very, very fine print here. And a poster, if anyone's interested. And this is the handbook that is available now. And this is the book that is forthcoming, spring 2022. Thank you. Any questions? I don't know how the Q&A is supposed to go. I'm happy to also talk more over Twitter or over email. My contact information is on the slide. I see a question from the audience, Erin Wilkinson. Um, I can um, mirror your, oh, do we have an interpreter who's going to? Can everyone in the room see me all right? It looks like this isn't ideal, but I'll, um, I'll try. Thank you so much for a very enjoyable, fascinating talk. And you've given me a lot of food for thought about documenting sign language use while, consider, excuse me, while considering the spaces that we are in and create as deaf linguists. I think that this is a very, very dense, multi-layered topic. And Throughout your talk, I found myself thinking about my own work. I have to say, I don't think I've ever done a documentation project. I am a deaf linguist. Um, and I don't think I've ever stated what my position is in any of my papers. So you've already given me some food for thought. Um, and I will certainly weigh whether I should, shouldn't, should have, should not have. But certainly in many ways, it is so important to recognize who we are as researchers. I certainly agree with that. But I think when you try to define what a deaf linguist is, it's so loaded because it also brings up things about what my relationship is to a broader deaf community in terms of doing documentation or data collection or analysis. And when I put it forward, am I putting it forward as though it's mine? Could I use myself as a participant in the study or do I, do I not? So I think that there are a lot of linguists that might not feel comfortable using ourselves as part of the research. This is a guess of mine. But I could also then think about how many deaf linguists there have been in history and what sort of models they have been for us and now that they were used as language models in other studies. That they were used as language models in other studies as I was. As I was. 
So that also then makes me kind of things that, think about things that I, wouldn't, I did not think about in that moment. And maybe I should have just made it simple. Hearing linguists do that as well. As they're writing, they say, that's a good English sentence. I like that English sentence. So as we're signing, we're thinking that about our own language use as well. Right. So I guess I, I came up here not so much to ask a question, but to share some thoughts and say that I think that what we're thinking about is that I like that you are pluralizing space so that we think in a more detailed way about what spaces we are entering, what roles we hold, when we are in those spaces, what our positionality is, and how that changes as we enter different spaces. And the framework that I use in one space may not be the same as in another, despite the fact that I am deaf in all of those spaces. So I think it's not an easy argument to make, but I think generally, people make the assumption that just because someone is deaf, that they're going to have an easier time or that, um, you know, in doing sign language research or that they maybe assume deaf means more than what it really is. So just wanted to share those thoughts. Absolutely. And I'd like to respond to those. Thank you so much. One of my goals for tonight was to really start that discussion and talk about why these spaces exist and how we can avoid assuming that we represent everyone. I don't want to represent all deaf linguists. I do not, and I cannot, and I never will. We all have different kinds of experiences. Some of those experiences overlap. And so what are those spaces that we create where we do overlap? What are the spaces that we create where we don't overlap? I cannot and should not represent all of that. But often when we think in these fixed categories, that's traditionally what ends up happening. I can then create spaces that allow for that. And we think about traditional linguistics has been done in specific ways. We want to add more variety to the ways that we are doing this work so that we are thinking about this in terms of our work as linguists, but also our positionality within the world at large, what that research means, how people use language in their daily lives. It's not just a research item, it is our communication and our lives. And so how do we open up all of that into these various spaces? And often as an academic, we think we're not supposed to do that, not supposed to include that. But I think it is important that we include it and we share with the broader communities who are not looking at it from an academic perspective about how all of this interacts. Oh, I think I'm beyond my time. Feel free to come up to me to ask questions or reach out to me on Twitter or email after this.